Ciao Bruno. Ciao Paolo. Where, where, where do I have the, uh, the chat? Um. For some reason, let's see. Okay, I think I'm the participant. Why don't I see it? Normally I use Teams for my classes. So why don't I see the, the chat? That's strange. They say it's available only for team member. Ah. Oh, maybe, maybe that that's why. That's why. The, the setup of the of the meeting. Ah, okay. So Sorry. eventually, eventually, I can I can send them straight ahead to the. Yeah. Okay. Basically, I will forward uh, to whom to Hello, Joe? Maybe Calogero, yes, he's your the organizer, so perfect. Okay, I, I forward I forwarded the email which I sent uh, this afternoon to Federica. Okay, thank you. Perfect. By the way, I started uh, the recording of the lecture. I started the record recording on the lecture uh, so that uh, um, uh, this will be a uh, community. Okay, thank you again. And then uh, Professor Dario, Professor Stefanini will introduce, and then there is uh, a welcome by the, the Student Association of uh, the Scuola, and then your So the recording of the lecture. And then uh, Professor Dario, okay, Professor great. Stefanini will introduce, and then there is uh, a welcome by the, the Student Association of Hola, So the of the lecture. Then the participation. Everybody of us cannot write. <coughs> <laughs> Very democratic system. Seventy one people at this time. Yeah, yeah, pretty busy. Well, I'm sure at the end of the day, we will have more participants than probably we would have had, uh, you know, in the classroom. Like, uh, because I know I've seen the names of some of our PhD students also attending the... So yeah. at least, at least, you know, let, let, let us put it in this way. It's it's a good side of uh, of doing this online, you know. Of uh, interest. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. I still prefer the... <laughs> The real, the physical. <laughs> yeah, but but nevertheless, you know, we, we we take it as it comes. Yes. I just take advantage of since I see quite a few names from uh, from our we have two PhD programs. Uh, one is on uh, in information technology and electrical engineering, and the other one is uh, on ICT for health. I've seen a few names which I've recognized. So um, for certification purposes, 
send me a message in the chat. You can chat me uh, because you are in the same organization, you are in UNINA uh, under Teams, and I will forward your names to the coordinators of the two PhD programs in such a way that they will uh, issue the certification for the credits you will have uh, earned this afternoon, this evening, with uh, by attending this seminar. So just send me just a note by email if you wish so, or in the chat under Teams, okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I am unable to send the message in the chat box because it's only available for the team members. So I think I am uh, attending as a guest, so I didn't find this possibility to send you the message in the chat. No. Who is managing that? Sorry. No, no, I'll just uh, mention. Hello, can you hear her? Yes, yes. I will be able to the person that is going on. Let me get the person that is going on. Bro, there are 102 people now. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can start? Yeah, anytime. I'm ready. Ready, okay. This is one of the largest audiences I've ever had for uh, <laughs> for, for a PhD seminar, indeed. <laughs> yeah, that is, this is in fact one, one, one advantage. There are many limitations, but this is an advantage yeah. of uh, remote. Uh, it's not like uh, seeing uh, your your Na Napoli sign live, uh, but uh, yeah, but, there's, but you know, there's, it's there's a fact. But you are uh, yeah. There is the jersey on the back, which was a gift from uh, from the club last year when I turned 60. So the, the jersey has all the all the signatures of the players. So oh, this is a, a nice gift from. Uh, from the from the dressing rooms organized by a friend of mine. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I think we can start. We're already 125. It's a huge audience, and more continue to, to get in. Okay, could you please mute your mics, uh, those of you who are not uh, talking? Okay, fine. So thank you very much. This is Paolo Dario, and uh, I'm uh, uh, one of the hosts together with Cesare Stefanini and other colleagues uh, of uh, this seminar that is uh, mostly devoted to the PhD students, but also the undergraduate students of the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna and many others. Um, it is my my real privilege and the great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Bruno Siciliano. Uh, Professor Bruno Siciliano is, a, is a, much younger than I am, but he's a real friend. 
uh, actually, I met him first when he was a PhD student, and uh, today is one of the leading uh, persons in robotics uh, uh, worldwide. Um, I, I was, I just wish to mention two two things. So probably he he has been a president of the uh, IEEE Robotics and Automation Society for two years and. Uh, has always been uh, a, a, a leading uh, figure in uh, robotics uh, worldwide international level. And the second thing that uh, is uh, really uh, remarkable is uh, the fact that uh, his book, the book that is published uh, uh, maybe 20 years ago, Bruno, more or less, and uh, more, more or less, you will say that, that is uh, one of the uh, most uh, uh, the best known uh, books in robotics worldwide. You know, when I uh, when I visit, unfortunately not in this time, but when I visit any place in the world, that there were students who uh, had studied on uh, Bruno's uh, book, and this is in addition to many other things, but just. Uh, uh, these uh, these uh, the two two issues I like to point out, and maybe I like to ask uh, uh, Professor Cesare Stefanini to continue this uh, short introduction to Professor Bruno Siciliano. Cesare, yes, uh, thank you, Paolo, and uh, thank you, Bruno, for uh, accepting to to uh, lecture in front of uh, our our students and. Uh, uh, they, they will have a, a, an extraordinary opportunity today to to listen from one of the of the of the roboticists that are leading worldwide huh? so bruno siciliano in addition to the book actually i'm i have two mentors one direct mentor very important mentor paolo is my is my mentor but then uh, during my university years i was one of the first students who actually studied on the on Bruno Siciliano book uh, of, of robotics uh, about kinematics and, and dynamics of robots and control of robots so uh, Bruno Siciliano is um, absolutely uh, a world reference in the field uh, after that famous book in Italy especially uh, he published other international important books in particular the handbook of robotics and uh, now is also uh, behind a very big important uh, uh, effort, which is the Encyclopedia of Robotics. So even more um, extensive uh, uh, introduction to to the area and uh, and uh, let's say addressing all the different uh, aspects uh, in robotics. Um, Bruno Siciliano uh, is also uh, very well known for his capability of disseminating uh, science and engineering. He has uh, participated in tech talks uh, and even uh, uh, invented a motto, uh, which is keep the gradient, right? Stressing the importance of trends, not just uh, um, achievements, right? But the, this idea of improving and, uh, and, uh, and going uh, beyond uh, uh, let's say the state of the art. Right? This is something that uh, I can say in front of my two mentors uh, is something uh, that really is in common of the both of you. Uh, you are really uh, an example of how to push the boundary of knowledge and of uh, uh, technology and uh, ultimately engineering. Um, Bruno Siciliano received important awards. Uh, the Itrapoli uh, Robotics and uh, Automation Society, George Saradiri's Leadership Award in Robotics and Automation, and then other awards uh, like uh, uh, Service Award, uh, again from the IEEE Society, for outstanding leadership and commitment in promoting robotics uh, um, in, in, the, in, in the world, actually. So, um, these are, and then of course national uh, also uh, recognitions. Um, so Bruno is Italian is from Naples. He has a strong passion in, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Italian culture and uh, at large, including sport, 
and uh, this is also very nice. So it is someone who is really uh, easy to talk to, and I'm sure after this talk uh, uh, he will be happy to, uh, I mean, at some point get in the contact of the ones of you who are more interested in some of his uh, uh, findings and uh, uh, projects. Thank you very much, and thank you again, Bruno. And please uh, uh, welcome Bruno uh, with a virtual applause. <laughs> and uh, uh, the floor is, is yours. You have to unmute, Bruno. We have a welcome of the uh, just a, a small. Welcome by the Association of the Students. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry. And yes, then sure. we start with uh, Bruno. Yeah, our yeah. honor students. Giuseppe. Yes, yes. Good evening. Uh, this is Giuseppe de Alteris. I'm a member of the Association Board of the Associazione Alighieri of Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. And so, welcome again to the second event of our cycle of seminars which is called Out of the Matrix, organized in partnership with the, the Biorobotics Institute of Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. And uh, we, th this cycle this year has gathered the worldwide experts in the fields of robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, and neuroscience. And we are really happy to notice uh, that uh, we are having a great success. Now we have uh, almost 160 people on Teams, and uh, 30 people on YouTube following us. So, and, uh, and um, these events are obtaining success among students of different faculties. So this means that we are accomplishing our mission to show that the latest challenges of engineering and technology in some way demand an interdisciplinary vision and the synergy between various types types of knowledge. So thanks to, to the Biorobotics Institute, uh, Professor Dario, Professor Oddo, Professor Stefanini, thanks to all the people connected and of course thanks uh, to Professor Siciliano for having accepted our invitation. Thank you. Very much. Okay. Is that, I think it's time for you, Bruno, now. Yes, yes, that's, that's, that's my turn. Yes, thanks uh, to, uh, I mean, I consider uh, Paolo as uh, both uh, a mentor, as an example, uh, for, for all my um, professional and academic uh, career. I still remember the very first time I met him. This was at the Romanzi conference in uh, Udine in 1984. This was during my PhD. I was lucky that I was admitted as an observer, as a PhD student. And uh, I met all the giants, all the, uh, you know, the big names in, in my field, you know, uh, Lou Paul uh, was there and Mike Brady and uh, Bernie Roth and uh, Usama Khatib, uh, Paolo Dario, all, all the giants, George Girard, Jean Vertu, Jean Vertu was there. And since then, uh, and Professor you know, Cato also. Yes, Professor Cato. And the young yes. Professor Takanishi. Yes, yes. So I mean, I was, uh, you know, this is just uh, like going to Hollywood and uh, meet uh, all the big stars of robotics at one party. This was unbelievable. I think this was a kind of turning point into, and I was just uh, a PhD student on my starting my second year. So I hadn't uh, attended any conference. I hadn't written any technical papers yet. And uh, I had the privilege of spending four or five days with the, with, with the giants. So we kept contact. I, I was just checking that uh, first time I visit uh, Scuola Santana was back in uh, 2001. Uh, uh, probably I think I'd been there before, but it was the first time I gave a seminar robot force control. And then I visit again in 2015, um, and so this is like I think my third official seminar at uh, at, uh, at Scuola Santana. So, and I'm I'm really flattered by the large. I think this is probably the largest attendance I've ever had for a for a PhD seminar. I count 168 people now in the in the in the Teams class. Uh, okay, so uh, I will start sharing my screen.
I have to remember to also share the audio. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. I think so, right? You see it. Hopefully. Yes. Yes, you can see. Okay. Here we go. So we, yes. we can we can start. So um, I was um, a kind of undecided about which topic to select, and then I tried to make a sort of uh, trade-off uh, between uh, speaking generally about manipulation and control and uh, giving a sort of survey on the on the latest uh, research results in the five since you know I visited in 2015. Uh, probably this is a good summary of uh, what we've been doing with my team on robot manipulation and control. And uh, before I start, just uh, uh, some figures about uh, the Prisma team. You see a picture in the lab. Uh, we're currently two full professors, one associate professor and four assistant professors. Uh, we currently have uh, seven postdocs, eight PhD students and 30 master's students. Uh, we've been quite uh, successful in raising money, mainly from uh, competitive research projects. And uh, we've been in the last, uh, uh, I would say, 12 years, we've been counting on an average financial support of 1.4 million euro a year, which is uh, quite remarkable for, uh, for a team of, of, the, of this size. We've been active, uh, I mentioned, you know, it's my PhD. I, I did the first cycle of the PhD, probably this. I think that the one starting now, if I'm not mistaken, is the 36th cycle of the PhD. The PhD didn't exist before in the in the Italian academic system, so I had uh, uh, the privilege of being uh, in just one of the first doctors, according to the uh, terminology used abroad, uh, here in Naples. If you if you wear in a kind of civilized way and you park your car, you know, just the guy, the illegal guy is a doctor, because doctor is a sort of honorary title you gain on the streets, whereas uh, it's, it's a much more serious thing, as, as we know, for, for, for the doc rate uh, program. So we've been active 35 years of research activity. And uh, during these years, we have collaborated with more than 150 foreign institutions uh, and, uh, and companies. Uh, the new challenge, since I visited in 2015, is the Icarus Center. Icarus uh, is an interdepartmental center for advances in robotic surgery, and I'm currently the director of the center. So this is a, a joint venture, uh, very much wanted by the current minister of university and research, who is my good friend uh, Gaetano Manfredi. He was rector of the University of Naples Federico II at that time. He was also president of the conference of uh, of university directors in Italy uh, for, for 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 several years, and he wanted to start this uh, this new challenge across the schools the schools of medicine and uh, and and that of engineering so we founded uh, the ecro center there are 70 faculty uh, who are active within the center five departments involved uh, two in uh, in the school of medicine and three actually two in the school of medicine two in the school of engineering and one in in, in the in the college in the school of physics and uh, just like uh, the the group at um, Scuola Sant'Anna, who was the first to become uh, a member of the DBRK, the Da Vinci Research Kit community with Paolo and uh, Arianna, uh, who I, I just say hello to her. I know she's busy with her team in the KUKA Innovation Award final this, uh, this evening, so she can't be in the audience with, uh, uh, with us this, this evening. So, uh, and Icarus is a member of a research community of, I think, I think I'm counting now 35 labs uh, across the world that we're sharing results and, and kind of advanced research on, on this uh, platform, which, which is very useful for, for research as compared to the, um, to the last generation of the Da Vinci system. <laughs> Nevertheless, we cooperate with uh, urologists and gynecologists and general surgeons also for the training of uh, their uh, uh, PhD students, and they they call like uh, I don't know the English for the 
for I think that I think the residents, the residents is like the school of specialization. I think that they they're called residents uh, for for just you know for training of uh, of on the on the actual Da Vinci system, which is uh, used in the operating room. Uh, this was kindly mentioned by Paolo, and uh, this is a long story that actually started uh, when I, um, thanks to my mentor, uh, Professor Lorenzo Chavico, who was uh, together with Paolo and others. Uh, I think Paolo is in between, in age, between Lorenzo Chavico, my mentor, and myself. You probably saw the uh, the jersey of Napoli, with, uh, which was a gift for my sixth birthday <laughs> last year. Uh, actually, I'm still six years old because I'm not counting this uh, this crazy uh, year. So I think I'm still 60. I didn't, uh, you know, I celebrated my birthday the other week, but this year doesn't count. This this is what we agreed with uh, our good friend Usama Khatib, who this year turned 70. Anyway, the textbook was uh, was a long story, uh, which started uh, in the early 90s, which when I started teaching uh, together with Professor Shaviko robotics in Napoli. And it has been translated, uh, uh, actually the, the original contract was with Megro Hill in New York, and then it was translated uh, in Italian. It was funny enough, an Italian author working out a deal with a company in Milano because simply they didn't believe that uh, this professor from the University of Naples could write a textbook in English. So I got the, uh, you know, the pleasure of being paid for the translation from English into Italian, and this was... Uh, you know, quite a deal, and also it's been translated in uh, in Greek by our good, our common good friend Kostas Kyriakopoulos. So for me, since I, when I was in high school, I did the so-called scientific lyceum, and I had, at a certain point, I had some regrets not to have done classical studies. At least I can say that uh, uh, a classic, I have now a classic text, although this is modern Greek, it's not the ancient Greek. And then it's been translated into Chinese, and of course you can imagine how many students in China are studying from my from my textbook, and it's quite uh, touching uh, in the in the latest years that I've been to conferences, giving keynotes at conferences in China. So all the Chinese students, you know, just so they they meet me, they have a copy of the book, and they want uh, a signature of uh, you know just on on their textbook. So this is quite moving. Indeed, to know that uh, many generations of students uh, are studying on my textbook. Uh, the world is changing, and uh, uh, one new challenge in which I've been involved is the so-called MOOC. MOOC stands for uh, Massive Open Online Courses. This is truly a new learning and teaching environment, and uh, uh, and this uh, our. Uh, our uh, university at uh, federica.eu is quite active on, on this web learning platform. It's one of the most active uh, uh, portals in Italy and also internationally because the contents are also available on edX. And uh, I still, since this was mentioned, I still remember when I was uh, a PhD student, when I was a young researcher and uh, an assistant professor, I consider teaching almost as a sort of uh, kind of waste of time, I shall say, I shall confess that it was a waste of time because I was purely focused on research and I wanted to spend time in the lab, I wanted to publish papers and I, want, I wanted to grow academically. I have to say, maybe it's a sign of age, Paolo I think can, can only confirm this, I think there is no more fun than teaching and, uh, and talking to the young students because teaching is pure adrenaline. Because uh, every year, I, this is I started my course, my robotic foundations course this year. So this is the thirty-first, the thirty-first year in a row that I'm teaching robotics. And each year you have a new class, and you also see how the generation change and things like that. So the thing is that uh, uh, you know this new challenge with Federica. After 25 years of lectures ex cathedra, this started like four or five years ago, and uh, this is really a new challenge because uh, uh, with this you extend virtually to the infinite, to the world, and uh, and the two course, the contents of my textbook are also available as contents on the on the Federica platform as well on edX, and I'm just sharing with you 
the trailer to the second part of my course, the Robotics Foundation 2, which is devoted to robot control, which is also a good promo, as it was said, of my hometown. Welcome to Napoli, a city well known for its rich history, art, culture, architecture, music and gastronomy. Let me take you on a virtual tour to MAN, the National Archaeological Museum of Naples. And this is one of the masterpieces of the museum, the Farnese Hercules. This massive marble statue depicts a muscular Hercules leaning on his clock. It's just performed one of the last of the world labels, which is suggested by the apples of the Asperidus he holds behind his back. Hercules is firmly grasping the apples in his hand by applying the proper amount of strength. So this is a ball, like one of Hercules' apples, and I'm going to place the ball at the tip of a slender stick. And I'm trying to hold the stick from the bottom by achieving a sort of dynamic balance. That's quite tough. And this is beyond the capabilities of an average human. Only a juggler can succeed in performing this task. Maybe a robot manipulator can likewise perform this task. Not only will we need models of the robot manipulator, like those that we studied in the first part of our MOOC course, but also we need planning, sensing and control, like those dealt with in the second part of our Robotics Foundation MOOC course. So you will learn how to interpolate a trajectory in the joint space and how to design a motion controller for the free space. On the other hand, if the robot manipulator is interacting with the environment, we will need an operational space control scheme. What are the two key ingredients for this kind of scheme? Force and visual feedback. Like those that you can see, the juggler is applying to perform this task successfully. To successfully perform this kind of advanced manipulation task, we need sensory motor skills beyond those of the humans. So I'm going to take you to virtually on a tour in Prisma Lab at USC of Naples, Federico II. My student has just released the stick, and the robot is successful in holding the stick from the bottom and stabilizing this dynamically. Rodiman is a bimanual humanoid platform having two arms, two hands, a torso, a sensorized head, and a mobile base. The wheels allow the robot to reach an extended portion of the workspace. So in the final part of the course, you will learn about wheel mobile robots, and you will learn how to design control algorithms for this kind of robot. Once again, welcome to Robotics and Napoli. I hope you will enjoy this two-part course, and thank you very much indeed. So this this was the uh, this is the trailer of Robotics Foundation Two Robot Control as a kind of new experience. Uh, I spent quite a few years working on a textbook which is now in its third edition, and as a matter of fact, this morning I've had a meeting with my two co-authors. Professor Luigi Villani uh, from my home university and Professor Giuseppe Riolo who is co-author of the third edition of the textbook together with my mentor. Uh, and uh, we're actually working on a new textbook because uh, I think it's time because the textbook was published in 2008. And uh, so it's a time for an update and for also uh, not only an update of the contents, but also uh, an update of, uh, of the of just of new of new topics which in our opinion, they constitute the foundations of robotics. But uh, the, the biggest challenge of my life in all senses has been the Springer Handbook of Robotics. Uh, this is, uh, I consider the handbook like uh, my fourth child. I have three children. Of course, I still call them children, but they are no longer teenagers. Uh, actually, no, my daughter is still a teenager. She, she will be 19 in December, but they are in college, they are only, actually one is working already. So I consider the handbook like my fourth child. I devoted uh, 12 years of my life from 2002 to 2008 and for the first edition. And the first edition got received a prestigious award 
which you can see there in the picture. This is the so-called prose award, which is uh, given annually to the, uh, by the American Association of Publishers to the best books for each category. So Springer submitted our handbook for the engineering and technology category, but uh, the sweetest surprise was to get the award of the award, the, the general Oscar, which was the award for uh, physical sciences and mathematics. The book which got the award the year before was a book called uh, Molecules and Medicine, just uh, to give an idea of uh, how broad. So this was not an award for the two, for the two guys in the picture that uh, they are on their private jet available by, by Springer on the McKinley Mountain. Paolo remembers this. This was uh, Ikra 2010 in Anchorage, Alaska. And uh, we took uh, this kind of uh, touristic flight to fly, to, uh, uh, to fly on the uh, Denali National Park in the city of Talkitna, three hour drive, uh, three hour hours drive north of, uh, of Anchorage. And then we landed on, at, the, at, the, at the foot of the glacier. And this is with, uh, with, uh, with my brother, uh, I would say in Neapolitan, Usama Khatib is, a, is a, one of the brightest minds that we have in our community in all senses, not only professionally, but also uh, socially. And uh, this was not an award for the two of us or for uh, Paolo, Paolo and the other uh, authors of, uh, of, uh, who contributed to the, to the book. I used to say that this was an award to robotics. It was the consecration of robotics as a science beyond the boundaries of engineering and technology. So before starting actually my seminar, I concluded this intro by showing a two minute video which summarized the story of the handbook. This was the, the party that we had uh, in Daejeon, uh, Korea, uh, during IROS uh, 2016, like uh, four years ago. It seems to be yesterday, but like four years uh, have, have passed since, uh, since that IROS. So this was uh, the handbook. And let me come now to the contents of uh, the talk. I will be speaking, as you realize, about uh, uh, robot manipulation and control. 
and uh, I will try to go just beyond what typically you have studied uh, in, in a textbook, like uh, conventional manipulation, I would say, and I will start talking about uh, dynamic manipulation, and then I will spend uh, just uh, some time on aerial manipulation, and then I will go back to the ground to say, and speak about uh, the use of learning techniques for autonomous manipulation. And then I will switch towards uh, human-robot interaction, which at the end of the day is just the merging manipulation with, uh, with, uh, with control. So I will speak about design of anthropomorphic tools. I will uh, uh, talk about interaction with the form of objects, then uh, some, some uh, recent results on human-robot interaction, and then I will, uh, the natural way of uh, merging manipulation with control is perceived in shear control, and specifically I will be talking about uh, hafti shear control. And uh, in terms of the perspective of the field of robotics, I have like two or three slides to discuss with you folks this evening about looking ahead, about the role of robotics, about AI and robotics and so forth. So let me start with the dynamic manipulation. And uh, this has been a, a successful uh, venture because uh, we got, uh, I got an ERC advanced grant funded in 2012. For that call, this was the only, the only robotics proposal which was funded in Europe. And uh, I remember that I was in the lab with my folks working on the proposal. And uh, we had this idea of uh, dynamic manipulation, which uh, in a few words is, uh, is manipulating object without necessarily grasping them. So without grasp, without uh, just, uh, uh, just uh, uh, grasping them in a kind of uh, prehensile way, but in a non-prehensile way, and also allowing the possibility for the object to be you know, rigid, to be deformable. And uh, we were kind of discussing about, uh, even though ERC is a blue sky research, so it's very speculative, you know, being a proposal on robotics, we wanted to show the feasibility of our approaches that we will have developed eventually during the project. And uh, we were undecided about uh, what kind of uh, case study, what, what kind of example to show dynamic manipulation and we were working late in the lab with, uh, with my friends, and we got hungry, and then we ordered a pizza. And then again, you know, I, as you know, I was born in Naples, I grew up here, and uh, I refused. I declined many opportunities to leave this country and to leave my hometown, because I feel, I personally feel, a sense of gratitude to my hometown, to Napoli, and also to my alma mater, University of Naples, uh, Federico Segundo. So, in a way, it was again Napoli to inspire me because I was looking at the pizza in the lab and then I said, we have it, we have it. Because I thought about the phases of making a pizza, which is a simple thing. And also, this was a sort of uh, kind of uh, a metaphor in my mind because, uh, you know what, Napoli is known all over the world for the pizza. Actually, during the course of the project, of Rodman project, uh, the pizza became uh, part of a, 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 um, an icon of the UNESCO heritage, has become an UNESCO heritage, which really gave m even more fame to the, to the Napoleon pizza known all over the world. And then I thought about the phases of uh, making a pizza as uh, a clear template for showing how agile, how dexterous, and how complex is dynamic manipulation. So I let you watch this video, which got more than one million views on the Mashable platform, in which uh, you see Rodiman, our uh, pizza chef.
Uh, the Rovion project, which was funded uh, from 2013 to 2019, the project ended last year, yeah. about dynamic manipulation, as I anticipated. This is the manipulation of non-prehensile, non-rigid, or the form of objects, and uh, the achievements that uh, we fulfilled within the project are novel techniques for 3D object perception, dynamic manipulation control and reactive planning and i'll be talking about uh, these achievements uh, in the next uh, few slides also thanks to the generous funding we were we were able to develop an innovative mobile platform so it's kind of a humanoid platform with a torso two lightweight arms with multi-finger hands and a sensorized head for effective execution of complex manipulation tasks also in the presence of humans and we are exploiting this platform for further project Thanks to the funding, there were a total of uh, 16 researchers engaged into the Rodiman team, including postdocs and PhD students from four different continents. So this was uh, a good opportunity to attract, you know, like talents and uh, young youngsters and brains to come to Napoli and also to work in our in our Prisma Lab. I did include it because otherwise it would be like too too lengthy. But uh, I was uh, a kind of moved last summer, the summer of last year of 2019, because I was invited to show, to, to have a Rodman performing at the world famous uh, Ravello Sub Summer Festival. Ravello is a gem on the Amalfi Coast. So Rodman was directing the orchestra of uh, the uh, pupils of the conservatory in, uh, in, in Salerno and the director learned the motion through the same kind of sensorized, uh, of biokinetic sensorized suite. So uh, just Rodiman conducted the, the orchestra uh, on the two pieces of Johann Sebastian Bach. And this was quite mo moving because on that stage, there were famous uh, directors uh, like uh, von Karajan and others. So to know that our robot just performed there was quite, uh, was quite uh, an achievement. Uh, let's let's talk about some of uh, of the achievements that uh, we we gained during the um, the project. And the first one, which I'm bringing up to your attention this evening, is visual tracking of the form of objects. So uh, typically, we start as as usual for vision with an RGB image, and then of course we have to carry out a visual segmentation of the object. So we have here a segmented image. And then the difficulties that the object is not rigid. So we can't use a CAD model of the object as, for instance, say in the industrial application. So the goal is to have an online real-time recognition of the object and also the capability of visually track the object as it moves while the forming. So that's why we thought about uh, the pizza because it's kind of the form of dough of, of the pizza. So, from the segmented image, we constructed the depth map, and then we have uh, uh, to, just for computational purposes, we try to compute a point cloud. The thing is that uh, we need a model for, uh, for deformation. And uh, I'm going to say a few words later, but basically what we did, we have uh, the, the current state of the mesh, we start with the rigid model and then we transform this mesh corresponding to the point cloud by adopting a well-known technique in the dynamics of a mechanical system. This is the finite element model uh, technique and we assume that uh, there is a deformation and also we can allow both for linear deformation and also for torsional deformation. So once we have the deformed mesh, it's almost done. 
And uh, I'm going to show you some results that we got for different kinds of deformations. Let me anticipate that you will see elastic deformations. So basically, you bend an object, you leave it, and it goes back. But also, you will also see plastic deformation, when after, after the formation, the object stays kind of stretched and doesn't go back like for elastic deformation. And also, you will see elastoplastic deformations in this video. This work was carried out mainly by Antoine Petit, who is, uh, was a postdoc in our team, and from the group of uh, Francois Chomet and uh, Eric Marchand in Irisa in Rennes, and is now a CNRS uh, uh, chargé de recherche in, in Strasbourg. So this is, uh, you see the, R the RGB image, you see the depth map on the upper right, and uh, this, well, first of all, you have the segmented image, and uh, here on the bottom, on the bottom right, you see the overlap of the projection of the mesh and the real-time registration of how the object is deformed. So as, and he developed an original algorithm for, for this system. And as you can see, you can model any kind of, uh, of bending object. But also, you can use the same technique, the same algorithm that we developed also in case in case you break the object in two pieces, so you have a, a kind of fracture, mechanical speaking. So again, you see how accurate is the algorithm to reconstruct in real time the object while it's deforming and actually it's being broken. Also, you can have a, a, a sort of fracture by a shearing effect, like for instance, you would do like uh, just with a piece of paper, and again, you see that how accurate is uh, the algorithm to reconstruct. The algorithm works as fast as uh, 20 frames per second. Also, you can have a different type of stretching action here. So this is different from, uh, from before because it's, uh, it's kind of uh, broken transversally, so to speak. And uh, the overlap here, you know, this is the fidelity of the scheme is, is quite accurate. In the same fashion, you can uh, also model with this uh, uh, modified finite element metal. So this that is a real piece of a real piece of dog of pizza here, and so which typically undergoes uh, plastic deformation. And here is elastic model and elastoplastic model. And this is the uh, how accurate is the reconstruction of the elastic strain and the plastic strain. We do this for recognition, but uh, also we want to be able to control the object and we want to be able to track the object. So again, this is a piece of the dog of the pizza. And here, as you can see, it's not only the recognition, but also is the visual surveying. So it's the visual tracking of the object. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's working really nicely. I mean, you can see how accurate is the tracking by looking at the frame on the bottom right, in which you have the overlap of the registration and the projection of the mesh. So this was the metaphor of the pizza, but uh, we actually use those results also for uh, different applications. We are applying some of the techniques uh, in the case of uh, robotic surgery, because uh, we have, you know, just for, uh, for robotic surgery of uh, the formable tissue, like the organs, uh, we, we are using this technique now in a project uh, that we have at the Icarus Center for uh, a robotized biopsy. And we're using some of the techniques for this kind of real-time recognition and tracking of the formable tissues. And uh, the funny thing, so to speak, during the project, I was invited to give a talk on this uh, 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 pizza RoboChef at an industrial forum in Parma. This is an event uh, which uh, takes place, it's quite a big event nationally, every year in March. And I gave a talk there, and there was a, a brilliant guy from uh, a, shoe, uh, a shoe manufacturer company who just thought about applying some of the concept to the shoe industry. I'm not talking about uh, the industry, uh, the shoe industry like uh, of all those uh, kind of massive shoes that uh, in just, you know, for, uh, for kind of uh, uh, big, for, for kind of uh, big customers that are done in the Asia. But I mean, these are the luxury shoes that of, of the big brands like, I don't know, Ferragamo, Gucci, and, and so forth. 
There are two cities in Italy. One is in Vigevano and the other one is in Macerata. Those are the two clusters where they make most of the luxury shows in, in Italy. And uh, basically there was a PhD student that worked in cooperation with them on an industrial PhD grant that uh, developed these techniques for, for the gluing of, uh, of the leather of the shoes of these kind of luxury shoes. So from this idea of the pizza, you know, this is really the challenge of, uh, of uh, Blue Sky Research as funded by ERC from the metaphor of the pizza we applied in the surgical robotics context and also in the, in the, in the kind of uh, industry context. Um, this, uh, this was uh, the deformable part of dynamic manipulation, but as I said, uh, what is meant by ma dynamic manipulation is also the non-prehensile, so the capability of manipulating objects which uh, without necessarily grasping them, like with a gripper or even with the multi-finger hands. So you have uh, this kind of uh, need, either because the objects are too heavy or too large to be grasped. Also, you can manipulate more objects at the same time, like humans do. And in this way, by allowing non-prehensive manipulation, you can actually enlarge the robot workspace. The challenge is that non-prehensive manipulation is subject only to unilateral constraints. So it's more difficult to model because you have to possibly model both the dynamics of the object and that of the end effector. Also, the object change shape as they move because we allow the possibility of the form of objects and uh, the quasi-static forces play a crucial role and the planning becomes very complex. And uh, I'm a control guy because I'm a professor of automatic control before being a, a scientist, if I may say so, of, of, of robotics. But from a control viewpoint, this is very challenging because all non-prehensive systems are under-actuated, meaning that there are fewer control inputs than the number of variables, the states you want to control. And this, from a control problem, it's a non-linear control problem, this is very challenging because of this under-actuation of the system. So I'm going to show you a number of results. I decided that without going into the mathematics, I'm showing the results by videos because those are accessible to the wide audience. You're more than welcome to contact me or, or the people you see, uh, you see just the co-authors of, uh, of these videos. Some of them are, of course, in my team. Some have left and have become uh, uh, faculty, like in Australia, Alejandro Donaire or Luca Rosario, Rosario Bonacore, who is a technical engineer at CERN in, in, in Geneva, and he works there. And I'm going to show you a number of uh, non-prehensile manipulation tasks. And I'll start from a very simple one, almost an educational example, I would say, which is the case of disk on disk, uh, disk on disk. So typically, this, this is a short description of, uh, of the setup. I'm going to leave the slides, including the, the video, so that uh, you can use them later if you want to go back to the presentation. I know that the talk is being recorded, nevertheless, I will also provide the slides. So, uh, if we ever attempt to achieve a manual balancing, it's almost impossible. It's impossible to do manually. So this is one task, as I said in the MOOC trailer, which is beyond the manipulation and the perception capabilities of the human. So we start with this balancing task. We want to balance the upper disk on the lower lift, on, on the lower disk at the zero degree. So you see the camera view, and also, I mean, not necessarily you have to choose a zero degree. You can also balance with an angle. So you can balance and achieve, you see the, the lower disc is rotated by 30 degree, and it's being stabilized. And it's a dynamic equilibrium, because the system continues to move dynamically because it's kind of dynamical balance. And it's quite robust, because you can resist to disturbances. So once you have achieved an equilibrium, and we try to perturb the equilibrium just by applying a small amount of force. So, you know, if, if the force is too large, the, 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 the upper disc will be dropped, of course. You know, that's quite robust. So this is uh, the first example of a non-prehensile uh, manipulation task, disc on disc. Uh, the actual control technique, for those of you who know about uh, nonlinear control technique and energy-based control, this is called passivity-based control. Uh, you can find passivity-based uh, uh, theory 
of, of nonlinear mechanical system in classical in classical books. And basically, it's uh, you exploit the main property of the Hamiltonian of the system that tells you that uh, if uh, the system, the energy is conservative, so it's a consequence of the Hamiltonian principle, the property that uh, the system is passive. So once you apply a feedback control, the key, you have to guarantee that the system stays passive because passivity implies stability. And you have seen that uh, the upper disk was uh, dynamically stabilized in, in an equilibrium uh, uh, configuration on the, on the lower disk. Also, we consider another kind of task, which is more challenging. Suppose you have a ball and you have a, a bike, a wheel, which is a bike tire. So now this is more challenging because the ball can drop like this, but also can, can drop like uh, in ju just upwards and backwards. So this is definitely more challenging. And we, we, this was the platform that we were, we were developing. So basically you have to, you see that the, you also exploit the redundancy of the system to reconfigure the system in such a way as to keep the dynamic balance. So from a control viewpoint, this, this is quite remarkable you know, to, be, to be achieved. Also, uh, I'm going to show you some more challenging task, which is uh, balance, dynamically balancing a ball on a plate. So these are some experiments performed by Diana. Diana Serra was uh, a PhD student uh, and a postdoc in our team. She works now for the, tr for the railway company in, in Italy. So uh, this is uh, uh, the setup again. And the first task is that just we're trying to balance and to control the position of the sphere. We don't care about orientation. So as, as we see, as you see, we, we, perturb, we perturb the sphere, but the system, uh, this, the video is speeded up by, by a factor of two, and uh, it's, it's kind of dynamically balanced. In the next uh, case study, if I remember well, you see that uh, you want to change both the position and the orientation of the sphere. So you want to make a path, and also not only you have a geometric path, but also you want to achieve a desired orientation. And again, and what I want to what I want to emphasize that this time visual surveying is used. You see the two eyes of Rodiman; those are two cameras. So this is a, 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 um, a nonlinear control which uses visual feedback in a real time, as I say, 20, 25 frames per second. And uh, this is even more challenging because uh, uh, you have a kind of more complex path to achieve. And also that white spot on the ball gives uh, the orientation. So basically, you know, you can perform all kinds of dynamic tasks. So this is a classical non prehensive task. And uh, from a feedback control purposes, it's quite remarkable that uh, is, uh, is correctly achieved without dropping the ball. So this was a rolling sphere on a plate. Also, this is the classical, this is, uh, I think, the phase number three of making a pizza, like baking the pizza in, in the oven, because first is a stretch in the dough, then it's tossing. I will also show some results on tossing, but unfortunately, we were able to drive them experimentally. We only got some really theoretical and results which were uh, substantiated only in simulation. So this is sliding. So as you know, probably the pizza, it only, it only takes two minutes to bake the pizza in the, in the oven. But a true pizza is not made by an electric oven, but is made, is made, is baked in, in, a, in a fire oven. So you have uh, the fire, the source of, uh, of the heat on one side, and uh, the pizzaiolo must keenly rotate the pizza. And as you see, this is a, a three-dimensional task because you want to control the position of the pizza, but also you have to control the orientation. So you have three variables to control. And typically, the motion of the pizzaiolo is a sort of swivel, uh, just uh, forth and back, and also just a sort of, uh, of uh, roll, rolling motion along the stick. So basically you want to control three degrees of freedom, three variables by only two control inputs. So as you see, Rodiman, uh, this is in real time. So as you can see with these two motion, just step by step, you can control and actually what happens, you see that red spot is actually rotating the pizza 
So ideally, this is emulating the baking of the pizza in the oven. So this is achieving this task, which is, of course, non-prehensile. And also, this is a bimanual task, because you have to coordinate the motion of the two arms and the two hands, and also even, the, even you know, just like uh, the, the whole system, the whole UNR platform is moved, and it's emulating the motion of the pizzaiolo while baking a pizza. I say tossing and catching. And these, these were the most challenging tasks that we, we tried to solve within the project. As, as I said, we got very nice and solid uh, theoretical results, uh, but all, we were only able to test them in simulation because experimentally the actuators were not powerful enough to achieve the kind of motion required by tossing and catching. And I want to acknowledge here the work of uh, the most brilliant mathematician who I've had in my team. Uh, uh, this is Aikut Satichi, who was with us a year and a half, and we just, I think we published four or five journal papers. Uh, I mean, he is, is really kind of uh, just, uh, uh, he did a PhD with Mark Spong at University of Texas in Dallas, and uh, is, is really kind of genius. And he was planning to spend more time in our lab, but uh, as we know, now we have uh, the uh, COVID emergency, which is uh, affecting uh, you know, just uh, the careers and the mobility of the PhD students. In that case, uh, uh, Satishi was, uh, was really jeopardized because of this crazy guy who is uh, the leader of Turkey, he's a Turkish guy, and uh, Satishi Aykut was planning to finish the postdoc and to become an academic in Turkey. I know his, his father is a professor at, um, in, in, a, in a prestigious university, I think it's Bogazizhi University in Istanbul, but uh, unfortunately his family started to be prosecuted by Erdogan, the, uh, the prime minister in Turkey, and uh, he realized that he, was, he would never be able to go back to his own country. So uh, he joined the team from MathWorks. He was working at MathWorks uh, after his PhD, and he's back. He's now an assistant professor in uh, in US. And before he became an assistant professor, he he, he went to work in the lab of uh, of um, uh, Rusty Drake at MIT. He's the guy on, with uh, uh, mobile robots on Rafty Rain. And uh, I wrote a nice letter of uh, of recommendation for him. And Rust called me on the phone. I mean, you gave me a gift. You, I mean, he is a genius. I know, I know. I regret that I lost him because, you know, I was planning to spend three or four years in my team. So I let you watch the, uh, this video, which, uh, is, uh, which are some very nice results about the manual manipulation for tossing and catching. That, uh, that this, this is primarily Aikut's work. So we have a, a first simulation test in which we assume a soft contact, so uh, at uh, at the uh, between the fingers and the disc. So basically, what you see here, this is uh, I mean, this is still quite easy to uh, to solve. But basically, the uh, object is thrown there, is tossed, and then is is caught. So you have both the tossing phase and the catching phase, which is successfully performed. In the second simulation uh, case. We have also, you know, a motion which also involves a reconfiguration of the system and a kind of tilting motion of the object. So because the, the, the system is redundant, it's also reconfigured in the most dexterous posture to catch the object successfully. And so these are the results. I mean, there, there is a solid uh, theoretical background with, uh, behind, behind this work which, uh, you know, uh, so we solved the problem in, in terms of some the theoretical results and some simulation results. The next video is about, uh, is a joint work of Diana with Aikut. And this is a, a classical task, which is a batting task, like the table tennis. And uh, you see Rodiman playing, uh, uh, playing uh, ping pong, you know, table tennis, we say ping pong. And basically, you know, it's, uh, it's a sort of, uh, in real time, is uh, just reconfiguring in such a way to always throw the ball to the target on the other side of the table. Uh, finally, we have some juggling. So we have a non-prehensile dual hand robotic ball juggling using a nonlinear least squares approach. This is again Diana's work uh, in which uh, 
we consider the uh, in simulation the Rodman platform, and in the first case we have that uh, uh, basically you know the desired position where you want the ball to be in the center of uh, of the paddle, so, so to speak. And as you can see, you know the system is also visually servoed. This is a VREP representation of, of the system, and actually you also you can also appreciate that you can have some kind of lifting lifting action when you bat the ball on on, on the paddle. And so this is a, a kind of a nice. You see the lifting action, yeah, yeah. So it's it's quite yeah. So it's quite uh, it's quite nice. There is a further case study in which. Uh, uh, basically, uh, the, uh, uh, the the motion is uh, is, uh, is becoming uh, 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 faster and faster. So the interval time for the impact is reduced progressively, and still the system is able to perform this. So it's a kind of uh, uh, shorter shorter duration of of the interval time, and so this is performed quite uh, successfully. So this was dynamic manipulation. Another topic on which we've been really, really active within our Prisma team is aerial manipulation. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think we are the team in Europe who has, uh, who has uh, earned the largest number of European-funded projects on aerial manipulation because uh, we got seven, seven projects funded on aerial manipulation from, uh, from the European Commission. I, I don't think that is, is maybe a group which got so many funded projects on aerial manipulation. What is aerial manipulation? It's a flying eye also together with a flying arm, a flying end. So it's not only is used for inspection purposes, but also for manipulation purposes. And you clearly see how complex is the problem because you could appreciate the difference between the case that you don't compensate for the motion of the of of the flying of the drone, which causes which works as a sort of disturbance for the arm, when, compared to the case on the right where you compensate and you can keep the center of the gravity of the whole system always in place. So it's not so straightforward compared to rounded manipulation, mobile manipulation, either on the plane, on a rough terrain, or underwater, or in the air, like aerial manipulation, becomes much more complex because you have to control all the degrees of freedom of the system. So you clearly see the difference between how complex it is to do manipulation with a quadcopter, with a quadcopter and a light arm. And the arm needs to be light because you want to keep the payload of the system as small as possible for autonomy reasons. So you see how accurate, how accurately the center of mass is kept for, for the system in the case that uh, the control is compensated. One scheme, you know, I could talk hours, I could have given maybe two seminars on aerial manipulation. So I just selected some noticeable results that we have achieved during the, the last seven years of work on aerial manipulation. And one scheme which was quite successful, uh, last time I spoke about uh, force control and impedance control, but basically we have here the possibility of uh, applying the impedance control concept, which each of you should have studied in, in, in a course in robotics. And the idea is to compensate for the motion of the drone and also at the same time to react to the external forces and moments. So this is a block scheme of the system. You have a planner, you have uh, the position impedance controller, and then you have uh, the references values for the trust and the attitude, and then you have an angular impedance controller because you have to control both the position and the orientation, the angular motion. So this is providing the torque inputs. These are the torque inputs uh, just gave the actual inputs to the vertical takeoff and landing a manned aerial vehicle. These are the so-called propellers input. And then there are, there's a full state feedback. And here, this is the main contribution in which we have an external force estimator, which takes the momentum, uh, uh, the momentum of the system and really, really works on both the, uh, uh, to update the trust and attitude references, and also for the computation of the actuation torques 
which take into account the estimation of, uh, of the external force. So I'm showing you some results in which we show the reactiveness of the proposed estimator in which uh, the drone uh, with, the, with the payload is interacting with the human operator. There is an audio, so uh, for this system, those kind of automatic audio with a storyboard, with a narration. So I have to unstructured environments. Experiments have been performed by using an Asktech Pelican quad rotor. An OptiTrack motion capture system has been employed to track the linear position and velocity of the quad rotor. The tracking performance of the passivity-based control with and without the compensation of the estimated external forces will be shown. The sole passivity-based control is able to perform all of the tasks with a good accuracy, but that the compensation is crucial when unmodel dynamics terms and unexpected situations become relevant. So Fabio is uh, simulating the wind here. In this case study, the quad rotor is subject to an external disturbance caused by a fan. The quad rotor passes twice in front of the fan before staying persistently in the wind flow. In the plots, it is possible to notice that the sole passivity-based control is stable even in the presence of both time-varying and constant disturbances. Performance can be recovered by compensating the external generalized forces estimator. In the external forces and moments plots, it is possible to notice the passages in front of the fan. Then I will show you a much more complex task, which is a truly cooperative assembly in which uh, uh, an, an aerial manipulator, so a drone with a lightweight arm, is uh, visually surveyed. Actually, for those of you familiar with the literature of uh, visual, visual based control, this is a hybrid visual surveying scheme. And uh, the actual technique to allow, to account for the various constraints is the generalization of the null space technique, which is used for exploiting redundancy. So this is based uh, on uh, the fundamental tool for robotics modeling and control. This is the Jacobian. So there is a hierarchical task decomposition and uh, the tasks with the lower priorities are projected on the null space of the Jacobians for the task with higher priorities. This work was carried out by uh, Professor Lipiello with uh, Jonathan Kakashe, who was at that time a PhD student. He's a postdoc in our team and hopefully soon he will become an assistant professor. So this is uh, a work done in the lab in Sevilla because this was a joint project with a team. I think I just uh, knew to the audio because it's going to be a noise. So this is not very really this is autonomous control. So the task is for the drone.
So, I mean, I, in the interest of time, I have to spare it and move on to the next topic, which is autonomous manipulation. So here, for autonomous manipulation, we concentrated our work again on the, let's say, on not comprehensive tasks. So basically tasks you want to perform with the multi-finger hands. So the thing is that uh, uh, the problem of the hands, uh, as you can see, uh, and as you can uh, guess, if, if you haven't got any experience, that uh, in my view, in, in our view, because I mean, this is a, a, point, a, a viewpoint that I share with many colleagues, I think the technology here has not gone forward toward uh, the uh, realization of hands which, are, which emulate the characteristics of the human hand in the same way as the arms. If we consider the KUKA lightweight arm that, for instance, you saw in the MOOC trailer, uh, the KUKA lightweight arm is, uh, is well developed and it's similar to the human arm. For the hands, we're not yet there. And one caveat of the hands is the fact that uh, you have uh, too many degrees of freedom to control. And the question is, uh, are you actuating all the degrees of freedom? Or can you eventually adopt a sort of minimalist approach mm -hmm. and use some kind of tendon couplings and uh, so as like the muscles uh, and, the, and, uh, and uh, also the fingers and the morphology of the human hand. One approach which has been quite successful in the literature is the so-called uh, synergy approach. Basically, uh, it's been studied. This, way, this is a, a guy with the University of Arizona, Marco Santello. He developed, uh, uh, so this is some work inspired by neurosciences. And for the human hand, the study revealed that uh, most of the most, most of the grasping motion, for, for most of the grasping for the hands can be described by some uh, main grasping configurations, which are called synergies. So, if you consider the first two or three synergies, you can describe by these three synergies most of the grasping uh, uh, actions that you would have for different objects. He actually has a classification of different graphs with 30, 36 different uh, uh, configurations of the hand, of a multi-finger hand grasping object. The nice thing is that the mathematics matches with the mechanics and the neurosciences because uh, robotics is a Jacobian. And if you take the grass matrix, which is actually a Jacobian, you can perform a principal component analysis, which is nothing else than a singular value decomposition, and you can compute the first two or three eigenvectors of, of the PCA, of the singular value decomposition, and those are exactly the eigenvectors given the base for the synergies of your matrix. So, because of this, you can actually realize the grasping action by a first phase in which you exploit the synergy for a sort of pre-shaping of the object. And eventually, you can also embed into this pre-shaping phase learning strategies and even vision if you have a camera. And then you have a second phase, which actually the adaptation, <laughs> the adaptation to the object that you require the contact force information. So these are like two photos, two snapshots, illustrating the first phase of exploration of the pre-shaping in which you exploit the synergies so as to speed up the motion and only use the first three synergies. And then you actually envelop the object once you also, if you have the possibility of embedding the contact force information. So uh, you, you are probably familiar with the click algorithm. If you have uh, studied on my textbook, the click algorithm is the closed loop inverse kinematic algorithm which is keenly used to solve the inverse kinematics uh, with respect to any kind of task. 
And one of the, uh, one, I mean, this is the work that I did uh, in my PhD thesis back uh, in 1986. One of the algorithms is using the J transpose, so the transpose of the Jacobian. So this is the adaptation of the click algorithm that you have studied uh, in, in, your, uh, in, in your robotics course to control the, the grasping in the synergy subspace. So basically, you can have some feedforward term which actually perform this hand pre-shaping according to the data set. So according, as I say, to the taxonomy of the different graphs that, 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 that you have. So you can account for the object shape and size. You can also account for the type of grasp. As you know, as you probably know, you just go to the original paper by Santello. You can have uh, uh, some uh, power grasp and also some precision grasp and some lateral grasp. As I say, there are 36 different grasp configuration, which can be classified according to these uh, three categories. Then you have a local adaptation, which eventually you have the possibility of exploiting force and position feedback. And then the actual uh, grasp configuration is computed according to an optimization technique in which you have uh, to formulate a mathematical optimal index. And so this is a synergy-based quality index and also you rely on a very nice property of grasp. This is the so-called, you know that in grasping you have form closure or force closure. Here you want to have a stable graph, so you want to have the force closure property to be satisfied. And also, if you have the possibility of measuring the force and you want to keep these forces limited without squeezing or just breaking into the object, you can also have a loop here which actually is aimed at regulating the values of the contact forces. I'm going to show you some results here. This is the expensive uh, five-finger hand by shoot, and we performed some experiments. Uh, this has, I think, eight motors, if I remember well. So uh, we, we have eight motors, but also we can map the motion of these motors into the three main synergies just you know to facilitate the task of controlling so you see the pre-shaving and also you see the, the, the end actually enveloping the object and you see objects of different uh, shapes which are successfully grasped according to this uh, click algorithm based on the jacobian transpose the thing is that uh, you also want to do to to achieve this result in a in a sort of intuitive fashion so like uh, the example of learning the motion directly from the pizzaiolo chef what if we try to learn the motion by the user so here in this video in a minute you will see one of my students he is wearing the biokinetic accent suite and those are compute those those i mean all the values all the sensitive values i mean these are like accelerometer and uh, and uh, inertial measurement units basically for 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 uh, for, uh, for the sensors used by this suite so the synergies are computed in the cartesian space and they are mapped into the joint space so as to guide the grasping of the object of the kuka lightweight arm so i let you watch the video so it's actually guiding the motion, and uh, there is a transformation of the motion in such a way that uh, with, uh, with, with this glove, you just uh, can, can just em emulate and do this in real time, as you can see, for grasping the object. Uh, what if uh, we try to learn from experience? And this is uh, the possibility of embedding a learning method into the grasping. So the thing is that uh, if you have a planning errors, and planning errors, of course, uh, easily easily occur, yeah, and uh, if, you, if you use a neural network approximation of the object feature, and also you account for the relationship with the, with the overall configuration of the system, because look at that, it's not only the hand, it's the motion of the hand and the manipulator and you have to really express you have to account not only for the grass matrix but for the overall jacobian of, of, of the system so the idea is to develop a sort of hybrid approach so we have a model 
but also we want to be able to integrate learning and control of the hand in a synergy subspace. So we use a Kinect sensor instead of a camera because it's cheaper and it works as nicely as a, as a camera. And then we try to learn in such ways to plan the grasp. And again, we have the robust click algorithm based on J transpose. So the difference compared to above that add, it's just relieving the user from the task of specifying the desired motion because now the desired motion is learned directly from experience, from the, from, from the experience on just using a learning method. So you can have, again, the local adaptation, and again, you can have the current regulation in such a way as to reduce the values of the contact force. But also you can do more because uh, you can learn directly from a user but also you can have a sort of self-supporting reinforcement learning that basically you use human demonstration and after a certain number of trials, in this case, uh, we need about 70 trials to be able, using reinforcement learning, to be able to grasp the object. So basically, we have a learning process in which we use uh, a PI2, a proportional in, uh, a PI2 algorithm in which we have a synergy-based policy search method. Uh, we use, as I said, some initial values for the parameters, learn from the experience, from the human demonstration, and also we use a reward function here in the PI2 learning process. And again, uh, in order to have uh, successful results, here there are, you saw the, the bottle, but also you can have objects of different shapes. There's always a sort of trade-off to achieve uh, between exploring around the object and also actually exploit all the trials in such a way as to have the system to converge after a certain number of trials. This was uh, a part about autonomous manipulation. The next section is, uh, is about some kind of design which is somewhat related and is in between the topic of manipulation and topic of control. And this is design of anthropomorphic tools. One of our assistant professor, Fanny Ficuciello, got a, a project funded uh, locally. This is a Musha project. This is a project for the young researchers. And together with a postdoc from uh, Shanghai Zhao Tong University, it's actually one of the most prestigious universities in China. Our good friend, Paolo's good friend, Wang Zong Yang, uh, just moved from Imperial College and now is uh, the dean of, uh, of the School of, of Surgical Robotics at Shanghai Zhao Tong University. Uh, it's one of the strongest universities in, uh, in China. Actually, it, it, is, uh, it is Zhao Tong University that did the translation of my textbook. So I, it, it, there is a, there's a Zhao Tong University Press that actually printed, uh, published my textbook. And they develop a hand, which is a mechanically robust anthropomorphic prosthetic hand using a novel compliant joint. And they have patented this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this new system. And also, they, uh, I think last year, they got an award uh, for, for an award given at Polytechnic of Milan by Deloitte for, uh, for kind of, uh, I think, one of the most original technology transfer ideas with, with, with this patent for the Mero hand. So I let you watch the video of the mare hand. So the, the main concept is to have a sort of minimalist approach and to use the compliance of the hand to make the hand cheaper and more robust as compared to the expensive 45,000 euro shunk hand that every, every few months it has to be uh, delivered for, for maintenance. So as you see, there are, uh, if I remember well, there are only two motors for this version of, uh, of the Mero hand, and there is a system of tendons and cables. And uh, as you can see, that's just the hand, you know, just as like, which is manually uh, operated and uh, is capable of doing a power grasp. And also, as you will see in a minute, is also able to do a different kind of task, which is a sort of uh, pinch task in which basically you don't use the other two. Well, in this case, you use like, four fingers on the left hand. On the left hand side, you only use uh, three fingers depending on the shape of the object. So you do a power grasp, you do a precision grasp, 
but also you can do a lateral grasp. A lateral grasp mainly involves the third synergy, the third human synergy, because it's a sort of a more dexterous uh, motion. There is also a test of robustness done with the mirror hand, and as you can see, the concept has been uh, really to get a very robust hand. Of course, this is just a mock-up, this is just a proof of concept, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's working nicely. The same concept, which one day could be applied, for instance, for some prosthetic application, could also be used for a minimally invasive surgery environment. This is uh, uh, one task in which uh, we use uh, uh, a multiple degree of freedom hand. This is actually the Musha hand. That, uh, so this is a different patent by Fanny and, uh, and, uh, and Wan Liu. So the idea is to build a hand which could be used for uh, giving the surgeon more dexterity as compared to the tools which are available for the Da Vinci system, but also we want this to be underactuated. We don't want to have eight motors like in the Shunk hand because that's fragile, it's too complex, and also, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very expensive. So we have uh, this uh, uh, Musha hand, which is uh, performing a power grasp, and as you see here in the video. And uh, remarkably, the hand is uh, sensorized through uh, FBG um, uh, 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 fiber brag uh, sensors to contribute to the dynasis phase in such a way also, also to have a feeling of, of the contact force and also to just uh, uh, couple, uh, combine dexterity also with a sense of tactile perception. Uh, also, uh, together with uh, Andrea Fontanelli, who was my PhD student, is now a postdoc and actually is, is employee now in uh, Neobotics. Neobotics, uh, uh, I know that uh, at Santana uh, School of Advanced Studies, you have uh, uh, you have, I've always admired your culture of, uh, of spinning off companies. And I think, I don't know, Paolo, how many startup did you, did you found? I, I, probably, I think, 15 or 20. I myself, we have five. The total we are, we have a smaller group, yes. but this is uh, the work done by Andrea Fontanelli, uh, who is now employee and he works in the startup of Vincenzo Lichiello, which is Neobotics, and they develop uh, Arial and hybrid system for inspection and maintenance. This is a, a laparoscopic tool with, so this is meant for basically for the Da Vinci tool. The, the feature, just speaking with the surgeons, typically when they have to do a, seat, a suturing, they just pass the needle and the string from one hand to the other hand of the, of, of the Da Vinci system. The idea is to provide the surgeon with some in-hand rolling capability to reorient the needle without the need of passing from one hand to the other. So I let you watch this video, which uh, is uh, illustrating uh, the, uh, percent, the what is the percentage of needle reorientation when a surgeon does a suturing or an anastomosis. Uh, so typically, we inspire, inspired by the hand motion we try to provide the surgeon with this in-hand needle reorientation. So this is uh, the way, this is another pattern, by the way, in which we develop a fifth degree of freedom, an additional degree of freedom, also just to allow the, to reorient the, uh, the, uh, the needle while suturing. So this is, for instance, uh, a trajectory which goes along a single stitch while suturing, and the modified needle driver allows completion of the task without passing from one tool to the other tool. Also, it, uh, it, it's, it, it, it's capable to avoid the joint length, and actually you have uh, a faster procedure, so you lose less time because you do with one hand. So, uh, you know, just now we are talking with uh, Intuitive about maybe just they will buy our patent. We don't know. Actually, the Da Vinci system, which is a four degree of freedom, has already a fifth degree of freedom, although it's not used. So we don't know what's going to happen. You know, just I let Fanny and the other working out the arrangements with, uh, with the people like Simon DeMaio, Dale Bergman, at Intuitive. Also, 
Speaking about interaction, so this is somewhat related to the work that we did in Rodiman, but it's different because other than uh, you know just uh, just doing a dynamic manipulation of the formal object, now we want to interact with the formal object. So basically, this is the work which I anticipated, and this is the case, for instance, of palpation of tissues that you might have in surgery. So here, you must be able to gain a force, a tactile perception through vision. So what we did, we exploited the work that we did for the tracking and uh, for the recognition and tracking of the form of objects in which we use a physical engine developed by our colleagues in France. This is a SOFA physical engine, which is a software packaging package allowing to simulate in real time uh, object undergoing deformation. So the, the way to achieve vision-based force sensing, we must compute in real time an estimate of the material properties of the object using a force sensor. So uh, I don't have time to go into detail, but basically this is the contact, contact force sensor. You have a simulation of the deformation, and then you do this block here is done offline to estimate, to have a rough estimate of how much elasticity you have in the system. And this is the real time part in which you have the same model of the environment, but here, as you record the deformation, you have a feedback loop here of the contact force. So basically you minimize the discrepancy between the simulated deformation that you did above and that which is registered on the real system. And uh, the technique works quite nicely. Uh, I don't want to go into details of, of, of this of these plots, but basically what I want to emphasize that the deviation between the registered deformation and the simulated ones by accounting for the contact force is actually minimized with this technique. Uh, this uh, is done this allows the manipulation of the formal objects, and uh, in this case, we can use the same approach, the finite element model approach, which we use for, for Rodiman, in which uh, we can have uh, in real time an estimation of uh, the Young modulus and the Poisson ratio, which gives you a real time estimation of how the formal ball is the object. So we use the SOFA uh, uh, tool, the SOFA tool, so we can have uh, a sort of uh, matching between uh, the planning deformation and the actual deformation, and we can use the outputs of this to drive the motion of the Shunken code of the Shunken again using a click algorithm based on J transpose. So this is the way in which. Uh, we were able to nicely integrate the real-time estimation of a deformable object, like for instance, you have in contact with the tissue, also with the Jacobian transpose uh, uh, algorithm. The next part is about human-robot interaction. When we speak about human-robot interaction, the main tool and the most robust tool, I think I've got like 20 years experience now on the human-robot interaction and, and uh, constrained motion control, is impedance control. The nice thing of impedance, or if you want to call it admittance control, is that you can also incorporate the resolution of redundancy. Actually, you can exploit redundancy to get uh, a compliant and impedance behavior not only for the main task, which is typically the task of the end effector, but also for the no space motion. But let's let's do this step by step. This is uh, the usual mathematical way to formulate a control scheme in the operational space. And as you know, we have redundancy resolution. So redundancy is actually carried out by exploiting the null space of the Jacobian. Here you have that the actual control torque is a, the, the torque as designed by impedance control. So this is the impedance control as uh, planned, as designed for the end effector. But also you can have an additional term, which is in the null space of the Jacobian. 
And the idea is to exploit redundancy by optimizing some kind of uh, performance index, which could be the classical manipulability measure, as you have studied in robotics, in, in the classical robotics course, but could, both, could also be something different. And this is the so-called dynamic conditioning index, which is another metric to characterize the manipulability. So the, what we can do, we can achieve impedance control, not only at the end of factor, but also in the node space. So we can have uh, viable impedance control parameters. And actually, we can have here, in this case, in this plot, you have different, uh, uh, different cases in which you can have, for instance, a constant mass for the impedance and the low value, which is very close to the minimum value. This one in gray is the stability region. Then you have L2, constant mass and high value. Then you have L3, in which you have a, a constant ratio here, T as lambda over D. So these are the parameters. And this is set as the minimum value within the stability region for any damping. And also, you can have a variable T, which is lowered to the minimum within the stability region for any damping D. So you can really play around with these parameters and according to the amount of damping. And I let you watch some results of a human robot physical interaction that we achieved within the Safari project, which is one of the 20 European projects that have been funded. This was about a human robot, uh, uh, physical human robot interaction. And this is uh, how to exploit variable impedance control. So, oh, I'm sorry, I was, this was the video, sorry. I was confused because this is the only video that I don't have in the landscape format. So this is a comparison between uh, the constant damping in which, uh, in which you have a constant damping, but the damping is, uh, is used both uh, with uh, a manipulability index, which is uh, lower right, and also with, the, with the, this new technique, dynamic conditioning, which is on the, on the, on the upper left. So the user, uh, Valeria is my, our secretary, is performing the task of just writing on a table by using impedance control, actually. And so the, the previous task was, and we intentionally chose some unexperienced, because at the end of the day, we want to show the feasibility and the portability with any kind of user. So if our cobot, our cooperative robot has to be used, it has to adapt naturally to the characteristic of different users. So again, you know, the task is, uh, is uh, so actually the arm is reconfiguring in the most dexterous posture according to the user to really please the user in the execution of this task. And here you see the, uh, what you can gain by adjusting damping. And so for instance, uh, on, on the upper right is the case of high damping, on the lower right, the case of low damping. So you can really, you can really try to make the user as pleased as possible in performing in performing this task. Uh, also, we can use the same principle of controlling the impedance in the null space to achieve safety in human robot interaction. So this is a video in which uh, we do the manual guidance with a multi-priority control. So this is our KUKA lightweight robot. There is a force sensor at the tip. So basically you can have any kind of impedance control. And uh, uh, my student has also designed a skin sensor, which is very sensible, which is placed just along the arm. So remarkably, the arm is compliant and not only at the tip as normally done with impedance control. So it's rigid elsewhere, but it's compliant in correspondence of, of the skin sensor. So you can easily done collision detection and you can also do reconfiguration of the system. So this is quite nice because actually you can use the cobot, you can use the robot as intuitively as you wish because the system reacts also on the forces applied to, to along, along its structure. In this case, it was one skin sensor, but I was discussing this issue with the Gerd Itzinger, with Aline Albuschafer at DLR, and uh, if you, the future is to have a sort of 
multi-sensory equipped arm with different sensors so that you know the arm can become as close as possible to the human arm so and also if you want you can change the reaction capability via control so you can make this uh, stiffer with with high damping or just with uh, with with kind of uh, lower damping you see you see now you know just uh, it's it's really under damped so as you touch it j just really just goes away so this is a, a natural way to embed impedance control in human robot interaction the last topic of this too long seminar and i hope you're still patient i'm not checking the number of users because i'm sharing the video so i don't see the camera and the typical teams uh, multi-frame is haptic shear control what is meant by haptic shear control first of all let me explain what is meant by shear control on one hand you have uh, actually teleoperation and telerobotic systems have been the precursors of robotic system i still remember the pioneer work done at by tony bachezi at uh, at jpl in which he, he had the first example of uh, a teleoperated puma robot this was uh, in the early 70s uh, the dream is probably and probably is never to achieve is to have a fully autonomous controller which is aimed at reducing the operator's physical and mental workload when controlling a complex robotic system for a long time period so the idea of shear control is in between teleoperation and autonomous control and one way to achieve shear control is to use an haptic interface so to use an haptic guidance method to inform the operator about the constraints which is acting on a teleoperation system so what is meant by haptic shear control is nothing else than shear control plus haptic guidance this is useful in a number of tasks for instance in hostile environments one task is remote maintenance this is the work that my student Mario Salvaggio is now a postdoc in my team did at uh, in Ria in Rennes with Paolo Robuffo Giordano who is another Italian actually in Europe there are a lot of Italians uh, just uh, spread out in in foreign labs and uh, uh, I'm sure that Paolo Cesare Ariane and the others could not give, could not agree more than the, the Italian generation the Italian research community in robotics is one of the strongest, if not the strongest in Europe and worldwide, I believe. So, uh, Mario did this work in which he considered a dual arm semi-autonomous system in which, which had the capability of vision and collision avoidance. And uh, thanks to the haptic interface, it was it, the, the, the system was informing the user, the remote user, about the constraints. And also it was possible to adapt the system to evaluate to the actual performance of the sub of the human subject per guiding the uh, the haptic interface and uh, he was able to uh, to control a system in a shear control feature so it's a semi autonomous the way you want to talk and again using a task prioritized interface so again robotics is a matter of is a game of jacobians and projection the node space with the task priorities but also in this case was able also to embed an eye to hand camera system so it's uh, it's it's really embedding the velocity by which is commanding the system the reflected forces and at the remote side where the slave manipulator is located there is also an eye to hand camera system and again the actual the, the successful approach approach no surprise goes to a passivity based control uh, you you at the biorobotic institute are among the world leading experts in robotic surgery and uh, i always uh, i always refer to this uh, uh, survey tutorial paper written by Wan Zong Yang Paolo Dario Russ Taylor and other giants of uh, surgical robotics uh, about uh, the taxonomy, about the levels of autonomy in robotic surgery. This is a very nice paper which appeared on Science Robotics uh, in 2017, in which you see the levels of autonomy. So actually, the status quo of Da Vinci system is no autonomy. We are, we, you know, just several research groups are working on level one, which is like robot assistance. There are already some successful experiments 
and, and results of task autonomy, and we want to go further towards conditional autonomy, maybe high autonomy. I don't think that full automation is desirable, if not for some ordinary task during a surgical operation. So with this taxonomy in mind, we are working on uh, achieving some increased level of autonomy and performing shear control in which we want the system like a Da Vinci-like system to be able to all, not only to execute passively the commands from the console where the surgeon is sitting, but also, also to exploit some concept which is known in the literature as virtual fixture. So if you have to do a suturing task or like an anastomosis, you can, you can have the local robotic system follow some paths and these paths are suggested by the remote robotic system to the surgeon. And of course, according to the autonomy, the surgeon has the final word because the autonomy and the final decision is always with the human, is always with the, with the surgeon. This works nicely in a haptic uh, shear control environment. And again, stability of the system, because you have to make sure that uh, the system is stable. And that's, this is really crucial if you ever want to implement this uh, in a real surgical operation is again assured by passivity-based control. Uh, so this is uh, the final slide in which uh, I'm showing you a suturing task in which uh, you have uh, to plan the stitches to, to do the suturing. And uh, in this work, we carried out a comparison among the two extremes, full teleoperation and supervised control. And also we are comparing with two techniques using shear control one using the virtual fixture, and also the other one is, is using the so-called orientation mapping. Uh, I don't have time to go into details, but the message I want to, show, to share with you this evening that uh, there is a way to increase the level of autonomy because you might have an unexperienced surgeon, or you can simply have a tired surgeon. So the suturing task, which is an important part, uh, portion of, 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 of the surgical task, can benefit by this kind of, of remote action suggested by the robotic system, which can compute and also you can, you can eventually embed into this kind of task, some kind of uh, learning techniques or some kind of data that you can have from previous operation. And this brings me to the final part of the talk I want to discuss with you is looking ahead. There is a, a lot of fuss, I would say. There is a lot of talk in the in the not only in the in the science community but also in the media community between AI and robotics. And uh, it looks like AI, artificial intelligence, is the panacea. is is uh, is uh, is used to solve all kind of problems of uh, of of life of human gender. Uh, this is promising, but. Uh, uh, I want to share with you this some message because I think it's I, I feel the uh, the ethical and the, the deontological responsibility of sharing this message with some young brilliant minds who are pursuing their PhDs to know what what is meant by doing a PhD in robotics. I'm showing this in a very simple way. So AI is about uh, is about intelligence. It's about cognition. But uh, as we know, to have uh, artificial intelligence to interact with the real world, we also need perception and we also need senses. So senses are very important. And uh, we have the five human senses and this uh, parasitic view of the weight, of the importance of the sensor, this was uh, uh, proposed by some neurologists, is uh, the so-called cortical homunculus uh, in which uh, the weight of the sensor and the importance of the sensor is emphasized by the size of the organs devoted to the sensing. So this cortical homunculus has really big hands, meaning that touch might be even more important than vision, okay? Now, artificial intelligence is about uh, big data, and in fact, you can have uh, a system, an AI system, recognizing in real time the faces of the people because you have an enormous quantity of data. So the data for vision are very rich and is a big data. 
What about the data for touch? When we speak about the data for touch, it's a different story because a child learns how to grasp an object and how to manipulate an object. And it's the very first interaction. Of course, a child also sees the object, but uh, learns how to grasp and how to manipulate the object also because there's some kind of intelligence which is embodied in the shape of the arm, of, of the hand, and the shape of the fingers. And you cannot do the same business with artificial intelligence because the data of touch, they vary from one user to the user. And you cannot objectively have a large point cloud, some big data. So this is just to, to tell you that the game of artificial intelligence and robotics is not only the game of brain, the game of cognition, and the game of intelligence. But in my view, it's also the game of body, it's the game of manipulation. And this is very much true for the sense of touch and also for the concept of embodied cognition. So other than quarreling, other than fighting, as it has happened in some scientific communities between AI and robotics, let's be proactive. What is the big challenge? In my view, the big challenge is not robotics overcoming AI or the other way around, AI overcoming robotics. In my view, the big challenge is at the intersection between robotics and AI. So the definition of robotics, as you know, is the intelligent connection of perception to action. So we do have intelligence, we do have cognition, and we do, we do have perception and sensing. The missing element is the action, is the physical action. So if we want AI to be as successful in robotics as it has been in a number of, uh, of, uh, of contexts in which AI simulators can solve all the problems of the world, we have to speak about physical artificial intelligence. And uh, in this context, I think that with the introduction, with the development and with the pervasiveness of uh, robots in our world, this, this is the concept uh, which was brilliantly, uh, brilliantly brought forward by my friend at the Scuola Santana, by Paolo, by Cecilia Laschi and the others, is the concept of the robot companion, in which you have a physical system. So you have AI and robotics. And in my view, we are living now in the 2020, in the transient, from information technology, which has been, which has brought the apex of information technology, can be considered to be AI. If you, if you wish, information technology or also ICT. I didn't uh, consider it the, the communication part, but it's about IT, information technology. So thanks to the development and to the evolution of robotics, we deal with physical artificial intelligence and we are observing the transient from information technology to interaction technology. So other than speaking about IT, we should start speaking about IAT, in which the A of the action is intentionally capitalized to emphasize the importance of the physical system beyond the brain, beyond the cognition and beyond the intelligence. And I want to leave you with, uh, uh, with the final, uh, with the final uh, uh, statement, which uh, is uh, enlarging the scenario, not only to AI and robotics, but also to engineering. And I'm doing this exercise by referring to a well-known uh, statement, which was done by one of uh, the most brilliant scientists, uh, Moravets. This is the called Moravets paradox. And uh, his statement is that uh, you remember that uh, a computer beat uh, the world champion of, uh, of chess. Actually, I was reading the other day that during the quarantine, during the pandemic, uh, chess has become a game popular as a game to be played uh, on computers. And there, I don't know how many million people are playing. And there was a guy uh, from, uh, I think from Ukraine, that there are some artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence uh, algorithms that uh, allow even uh, even uh, the unexperienced player 
to beat the world champion of chess because everything is computed in real time. So this is very much very appropriate now, the Moravec paradox, and it says that it's comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligent tests or playing checkers, by no chance, and difficult or impossible to give them the skills of not an adult, of a one-year-old child when it comes to perception and mobility. So physical artificial intelligence is the challenge, is much harder than artificial intelligence. So the final message I want to share with you this evening that we cannot leave to AI decisions which may have safety, moral and legal consequences because we cannot ensure the outcome. And there is no other road to take than having AI robotics with the proper engineering technology. So again, I emphasize that robotics is a science beyond the boundaries of uh, technology and engineering, beyond the boundaries of mechatronics. But uh, because of this, don't, don't jump too forward, too high, because we cannot ignore the physical and uh, the physical constraints which are imposed by a specific robotic system be it flying underwater, on ground, or so forth. So, I apologize for having abuse of your patience, of your time this evening. And as Cesare kindly mentioned, I want to leave you with my mantra, the keep the gradient uh, philosophy that I share with, uh, with everybody, with, uh, with my colleagues, with my students, actually with my family, uh, this is uh, not only to keep the direction of the positive gradient as uh, the mathematics, as we learn in mathematics, but is doing this in general for, for the benefits of all. And I think and I feel very privileged to have uh, chosen robotics as, uh, as my field, as my professional field, because at the end of the day, robotics is about humans. Actually, there was a, a nice statement that... Uh, uh, um, a, a, a human is a robot with some defects because, uh, of course, you know, it, it has kind of soul sentiments and things. We can speak about sentiment machines, uh, but uh, the keep the gradient philosophy is really to advance the field. And this continuous challenge of robotics has very much inspired my 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 whole life, and uh, and this is really what I try to transmit to the to the generations of youngsters, especially those like you folks that have decided to pursue a PhD in robotics. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. I thank you very much for your patience. And also I sent some open questions which could be used also to check, you know, the uh, the uh, comprehension of the topics I spoke with I spoke about so seven questions about my talk, and you can use these questions. I don't need to be checked by me; it can be checked locally by my colleagues at the Scuola Santana to just to gain the credits for for this seminar. Again, thank you so much for your time and patience. And uh, I would leave now for uh, discussion. I'm surprised there are still 143 people, which is uh, quite remarkable. Yes. Probably they are just delaying dinner. Usually here we have dinner much later, yeah. but we are in southern Italy. Probably in Pontedera uh, or elsewhere, wherever where the people are, just they have dinner earlier. So I really apologize for having uh, just broken into your supper. Or uh, supper is not a good word for Napolitans and uh, dinner. Supper is, uh, is too much north for my taste, you know, just to have uh, to be a meal. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Bruno. Of course, we cannot applaud. I will do for on behalf of everybody. But really, thank you so much for this inspiring, inspiring seminar. I think that for all the PhDs who are attending uh, the seminar, I, I, I hope you realize the privilege you had uh, on, on listening uh, a, a, a person, a scientist like uh, Professor Siciliano, who really provided us with a vision 
uh, a global vision together with a number of uh, practical example, concrete example. So this is uh, how robotics uh, is and how uh, top uh, robotics scientists are. Thank you very much, Bruno, really on behalf of everybody. So I'd like to maybe uh, have a short discussion. Uh, as uh, Professor Siciliano said, you will get uh, tomorrow, I think, uh, uh, by uh, Federica Radici, the questions, the questionnaire, so that uh, you can provide uh, written uh, feedback and uh, to, to have a formal uh, credit for this seminar. But meanwhile, we can ask some questions. I would like to ask uh, Ilaria Fagioli of the Honor Association. I hope she's there to maybe... Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, Ilaria, uh, you can manage a few a few questions if... You, uh, yeah, great. Um, we need a uh, girl and, and young people, you know, <laughs> for the future of robotics. Go thank on. you, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dario. Thank you, Professor Siciliano. I am Ilaria Fagioli. I am an engineering honoris student at Scuola Sant'Anna. And now we will have the portion of the event dedicated to comments or questions that you can directly ask to Professor Siciliano. And you can participate to the conversation by raising your hand. Uh, please wait for me to call your name before unmuting your microphone. Uh, even though we do not have much time and, and there are quite a lot of participants, we will try to get to at least a couple of questions, I think, or comments. And so everyone that would like to intervene can now uh, raise their hand. I will check the list of participants. <clears throat> I don't know if uh, in the meanwhile, uh, Professor Oddo, Professor Stefanini want to intervene. Okay, I will, uh, I will just uh, start with one question just to begin. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for the beautiful uh, lecture. And um, regarding, uh, uh, let's say, the frame rate uh, or the, uh, let's say, bandwidth of the system, those 20 hertz that uh, sometimes have been cited, right? Um, uh, 20 hertz is, is good, in fact, for, in my opinion, also for, for the, that kind of task. But if we want to push, what is the bottleneck currently? Are sensor speed or computation speed? Uh, I, I would answer in this way. The um, I think that, uh, of course, that's with... Uh, with cheap sensors, you know, because you can have 20 hertz with a Kinect or with a normal off-the-shelf camera. Of course, you can use also this kind of, uh, you know, just uh, um, like a high performance camera, like, uh, you know, dynamic cameras. Like you can go up to 100 hertz and, uh, and even faster. Um, the, the thing is that uh, for, for visual surviving applications, it might be worthy to spend more and to have like uh, some kind of uh, let's say even one millisecond, you know, you can you can have a, you can also have an FPGA, a chip, which which is uh, doing the tracking at uh, at one millisecond. Uh, the thing is that uh, uh, often is the case that uh, you have to do uh, sensor fusion, so you have to merge like visual data with uh, with the tactile data. And even with other types, uh, other types of sensor. Now uh, there are some effective uh, um, fusion, uh, sensory fusion algorithms, but uh, again, it, it it really depends of uh, what you want to achieve. I mean, normally when we speak about visual surveying, we're always speaking about uh, low level uh, computational vision. Then if you want, for instance, uh, for those deformable objects, uh, of course, basically, we, we care about the silhouette of the object, but we don't do any kind of processing to really recognize, let's say, one pizza from the other. You know, what, so basically, we, we're just concerned with, with the silhouette because we do low, you know, kind of low level computational vision. Now, uh, is it really worth it? 
to have uh, some sort of uh, faster sensor uh, if uh, you are uh, kind if if the caveat is that uh, for high for for high level purposes you will need more time anyhow you know to if you want to do this real time so at the end of the day i think that uh, if we can and also there is another another issue which i think is important if we if our dream to make one day a personal robot as it was the case with the personal computer and things like this i mean just a, a robot you know today must cost on the order of 1000 euro this is a kind of figure of comparison so in this case you must use some kind of off the shelf sensing technology and you have to get the best out of it so this is i think the inspiring uh, trade-off that uh, should uh, really guide the, um, you know, the, the, the use and uh, the diffusion of this system in a number of, uh, of uh, you know, contexts, in a number of scenarios, which are not the specialist scenario like, for instance, uh, for industry, manufacturing or inspection and maintenance, where you can afford using expensive systems. So it, 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 really, it really depends. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, pragmatically, uh, I think uh, let's try to pull the best out of uh, some kind of inexpensive technology using, so that's why frame rate, you know, 20 years, 25 years, I think it's enough. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, Ilaria? Do you have questions or uh, uh, I, I don't see any raised hands. Maybe people are getting angry, but uh, <laughs> uh, I can still see a lot of participants. I don't know if uh, Carlo Alessi has raised uh, his hand. Okay, Carlo Alessi, you can don't be talk. shy. Don't be shy. You can ask, you know, and we are the so you know, uh, yeah, there is another one. So, but, my number is. Exactly. We can speak I have a question uh, regarding um, the intersection between uh, robotics and AI because uh, I feel I'm uh, uh, one of these guys in the middle as uh -huh. I studied computer science and uh, artificial intelligence uh, in the master and, uh, and now trying to switch to biorobotics. So I find myself... Uh, in a exploitation versus the exploration problem because uh, from one side I want to be an expert of AI because uh, that's what I study. From the other side I need to study robotics because uh, I needed to succeed in my PhD uh, otherwise I wouldn't have applied uh, in this uh, PhD. So in practice, uh, very pragmatically, what are the chapters uh, that I should be studying uh, of your book? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you how would you move between uh, these two fields without, without uh, losing your? Uh... I can't. Uh, you know, I, I give you I give you a kind of pragmatic uh, pragmatic answer. Study the Jacobian. So if if you no no I, I'm serious you know just I mean in the end in the end you know the the Jacobian is the fundamental concept to really understand means you know because uh, I'm really extremizing because uh, I mean of course you know there is there are a lot of mathematical tools but uh, I think I think uh, I mean a, what what is a robotic system. A robotic system is a, a sort of a machine interface between uh, humans with, uh, with, with intelligence and the world and the environment, right? So because you're trying to emulate the, uh, the, the jobs, the work done by human cognitively and physically, right? Then also socially, but this is another topic. So uh, this, this interface, which is the robot, is uh, the robot is, is actually moving in the robot space, in the configuration space, 
Whereas we, the user, are just planning our motion, our actions, and our life into the operational space, into the task space. So the mathematical tool which uh, maps the two spaces is, is the Jacobian. And the Jacobian allows to relay the motion and the forces because the Jacobian maps the joint velocities to the task velocities and dually the contact force, and you have contact forces because, because you have a physical interaction with the environment, with the torques which drive the robot. So I think the most important concept, uh, and I'm quite, uh, uh, I'm quite convinced of this, when you want to really learn how to use the models of, uh, of uh, I hope you agree with me that uh, uh, since you come from computer science, of course, you think that uh, you know people working in robotics in computer science often regard the system, the robot as an agent, you know, not with a physical, not with a physical shape, um, you know, consistency and things like this. But the robot is a physical system. And if if the system if you, if you consider this physical system, at least you need the tool to transform what you have in mind in your brain, which normally is the 3D space, okay, it's our operational space, and the robot which is moving in a different space. So that's why I usually teach my students that the concept, the fundamental concept to really link the human space with the robot space, I'm trying to extremize the concept of task space and configuration space, is the Jacobian. And with the Jacobian, again, you know, just most of the schemes that uh, I show you the results are using the Jacobian because the control action is performing, is the robot to do the action in place of the human. And robots is moved thanks to the motion to the joints. And you need this tool. Then, of course, you can, uh, you can consider the dynamics, you can consider everything, but mathematically, you can show that uh, all the terms that you need for uh, modeling at large robotic system are based on this fundamental concept. And this is nothing new, because uh, this concept of kinetostatics duality was not invented by us, the roboticists, but it was invented three or four centuries ago with, with the people developing the Lagrangian dynamics and the concept like this, and the beautiful principle of mechanics, which is the principle of virtual work. It's from the principle of virtual work that all the mathematics and all the modeling comes to mod up to modern robotics. And this must, uh, must be understood. The nice thing about robotics is that uh, we look at this concept not only from the mechanical viewpoint, but uh, what I like about robotics that uh, we concentrate not only on the mechanical aspects, but uh, we focus on the system aspect because it's just extending the concept from the mechanical system as our colleagues in mechanics do, because this concept can be generalized. For instance, for instance, for, for visual servoing, there are some schemes which use an image Jacobian. The image Jacobian is not a physical Jacobian, is a Jacobian mapping two sets of data, but again is a Jacobian. So I think what we have, one day maybe I will, when I will retire, I will join Paolo and we will write maybe a nice book about, uh, about the kind of, uh, the, the, the kind of science philosophical aspects of robotics. This is one thing, because I think in robotics, we have been able to really kind of extrapolate the concepts from classical mechanics and together with the tools of computer science and vision is very much about computer science. And again, not, no surprise when we speak about visual surveying, if you look at my textbook, you find the so-called interaction matrix and you find that a mathematical tool, which is the image Jacobian. It's not the physical Jacobian, but it's kind of the same concept extrapolated to relate the measurement rates 
of your visual system, as Cesare was saying, as, as you move to the quantities by means of which you represent the image on the image plane. And this is, in a few words, the concept of the image Jacobian. So this is really the beauty and uh, the kind of, uh, of course, I'm biased because I'm fun, I'm fond of robotics, but I find this for me as being uh, really the kind of, uh, kind of apex of all the mathematics, physics, and uh, computer and uh, you know computer science that I studied because I think that all these merge into a number of tools which allow to describe a robotic system not only for its geometry for its mechanical but also for the sensing part and for the planning part is the same story very nice Ilaria gotcha. do you manage Thank yeah. you, thank you, Carlo. Uh, and now there is Zachary. I see you raised your hand. Oh, yes. Thank you, Professor Ciliano, for a beautiful presentation. I love what you just said a few moments ago about robots being the interface between humans and, um, and the world. And perhaps somewhat philosophically, uh, I was wondering if you had any um, insight or perspective regarding what you think is needed from the human side in order to in order to be more effective in the way that we develop and integrate robots in our society. What are things that you think um, need to be better understood by people who are not dedicated roboticists, people who are maybe maybe scientifically minded but don't know. The, the discipline itself, what, what can we convey to the outer world that will help robots integrate better and serve us better? Yeah, the, uh, that's, that's a very interesting question, very stimulating. I could answer for hours, but I'll try to be, to be short. And I say that uh, I spoke about uh, um, the, the fusion of robots. Uh, I mean, I didn't give many examples of, uh, of like service robotics because uh, I was a kind of level of abstraction that I consider the scientific challenges. But of course, this metaphor of the pizza or just, you know, it's just uh, you know, to show a kind of uh, daily task. Uh, what is, uh, uh, okay, what is missing? I think uh, I will answer in a kind of pragmatic way. This is a smartphone, okay? When you use a smartphone, you don't, you don't check this, you don't need to be an expert to use a smartphone. You just uh, turn it on and then plug and play. And everybody, not only, well, even, even the, the, old, the old people are able to use <laughs> a smartphone, not only the millennials, okay? So uh, when, I mean, this, uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, pathway will lead robotics technology to become pervasive and ubiquitous when anyone can buy a cheap inexpensive robot and use it use it for some of human tasks as intuitively as possible without the need of knowing what is uh, like an app what is a robot the, the robot has sensors this also has a sensors right okay but uh, you know i know that it has a sensors but the normal user doesn't know doesn't even know that there are sensors. Things that it's kind of intelligent in a, in a, in a broad way. So uh, uh, we will discuss this. Uh, there will be an event. For those of you who are interested, I will maybe, uh, if I, I don't see the chat, but there will be an event organized by Universal Robots on November 26th. I, I'll send the link to Calogero, Cesare, and the others. Uh, I think it's, it's free. Everybody can join. And uh, it's, it's called Estat General on collaborative robotics, because Universal Robot is one of the makers of cobots. And we will speak about how intuitive as a cobot to become, to have a, a market which could be as wide as the normal or the other robots, because it's still a kind of niche. It's still a kind of research-oriented platform, although there are manufacturers that also make inexpensive cobots now because Frank and Mika by Sami Adadin is one company that they make a, a, a cobot, which is 
much less expensive than the KUKA lightweight robot, which was the first one in our community. So what is missing? Uh, we have to make these machines to be as, as intuitively interfaced with the humans, and this requires also the possibility of, uh, of uh, just uh, operating them without the need, as you said, to be, to, to be experts, because, uh, uh, you know, this must be, and also, they, they must be, they must become more acceptable, because, and, but the things are changing, because if you ask me this, this same question, like 10 years ago, I would hesitate to imagine a kind of scenario in a normal environment, like a home, like a school, like a hospital, in which you have a sort of uh, humanoid-like robot, because uh, people are scared about technology in the Western world, because people tend to interact with this technology as long as, as a kind of shape, an aspect, which is clearly distinct from the aspect of humans. You know that in Japan, in the Oriental culture, is the opposite because uh, the Japanese are Sintoists and they believe that uh, machines have a soul and a, a machine to become acceptable by humans must have the same aspect of a human or, or an animal. This explains why they were the pioneers in making humanoids and in making uh, zoomorphically inspired robots. Now, this perception has changed because uh, you, can, you can find a robot uh, as a receptionist, you can find a robot in, a, in, a, in an airport or in, 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 in another context like this. So this is the, well, the, the, very, the very concept of uh, robotics for all, robotics for citizens. It's the concept that uh, Paolo was a pioneer 15 years ago with this concept of uh, robot companion. So to, to make this happen, we have, but of course, this requires a lot of work, you know. This kind of technical work, which I show you about, uh, that you can really play with the robot, you know, with variable impedance, then this can be can be implemented in a very low cost fashion, on even even on kind of commercial systems, because the sensors now, the, I mean, they cost less and less. Technologically, they are more developed and more advanced than the performance and the range of uh, the range of human senses. We have intelligence, so why not to aim at creating robots which uh, can assist humans in a number of tasks? And this is also to overcome the typical stereotype, which uh, because of robotics and automation, we will have uh, technology unemployment. This is false, because there will be some jobs which will be replaced by robots, because they, they, they are either dangerous or alienating, frustrating. Or, for instance, we have one project, one of the European projects that I coordinate is about robots assisting clerks in supermarkets and in warehouses, in which it's not only the scanning of the shelves to check the missing items, but they're helping the clerks. So, uh, one of the startup companies of Scuola Santana, you know, it's a Uvo. Uvo was bought by Comau and Osur, and they do exoskeletons, they do wearable robots, not only for the people in the hospitals for rehabilitation, but those are used by workers on, on the automobile plants. So this is uh, the really the pervasiveness of this technology, which be, must become really, really kind of uh, pleasant for the humans. And uh, I mean, we could discuss hours on this, but I think this is uh, the, the real challenge of our community. And uh, we very much trust in the, in the young, brilliant minds like you to really help us, you know, the more senior people to make this important step. Thank you, Zachary. Uh, I think we are a bit short on time. We have time for one more question. I see Francesco has his hand raised. You can talk. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Uh, thanks. So, uh, thanks, Professor Siciliano, and also to the organizers for this uh, really interesting talk. Uh, I mean, my, my question comes uh, as a fan of uh, classical robotics and control theory. Uh, so, uh, recently, uh, uh, artic art artificial intelligence and model free uh, methods such as reinforcement learning are starting to uh, tackle uh, significant challenges in robotics, uh, such as uh, in hand manipulation or uh, dynamic locomotion of legged system, for example. Uh, so my question is, uh, if you could comment on this sort of uh, duality of uh, model-free methods and uh, model-based methods as are typical of classical control theory, especially when it comes to uh, systems that might be uh, difficult to model, such as uh, soft robots, uh, or uh, legged system or manipulation when a uh, uh, lot of contacts uh, uh, with environments are uh, present or uh, yes, this type of... Uh... Yeah, yeah. My, my answer, my answer, of course, I come from a, from a kind of a solid <laughs> background. Uh, so my answer is I believe in, uh, in, uh, in hybrid approaches. So I don't think, uh, for me, there is no, there is no discussion, there is no fight between uh, model-based and data-driven approaches. It is true that uh, you might have uh, such a complex system that it's so difficult to model and you want to rely on this kind of uh, deep learning or just uh, models. But uh, I mean, like uh, even for uh, even for like autonomous cars are, are robots at all effects, okay? And AI is very much used for, uh, for autonomous cars, that's fine. But, uh, but then, you know, just uh, an autonomous car, car is not a spot moving uh, on some kind of screen. It's, 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 it's also a physical system. So when uh, a decision must be taken, whether, for instance, uh, avoid a pedestrian or maybe kill the pedestrian because of, you know, all the disputes that we, we know about the ethical, legal and societal aspects of robotics, uh, there is also the issue about is the system able to break and you have a, a contingency, a physical contingency to account. So you cannot ignore, you cannot ignore the, the physical models and you cannot, so why not trying to pursue towards hybrid approaches in which uh, you start with the, the, your best model approximating the reality and you try to enrich them with uh, reinforcement learning with uh, with data but the problem is that uh, data for instance uh, in surgery you can have a lot of uh, data visual data from other operations okay now do you have uh, big data about uh, touching so certainly not so i mean then, then you may wonder, okay, I can probably learn, I can just scan the motion of the number one surgeon while doing an operation, and then I can use those data and think like this. Yeah, but uh, this is true. But at the same time, there are some mathematical tools to describe, I mean, one story, for instance, uh, now robotics, uh, surgery robotics is developing not only for the surgery of uh, soft tissues, but also of rigid tissues, which might look easier because of rigid body, but actually it's not. Because uh, there are, uh, you know, they are using, for instance, for implato implantology, in the case of uh, dental surgery, now they are using, I, I, I had uh, knee prosthesis last year. I, I am bionic now, 100%, because I have artificial knees now, both at the age of 60, 60 I, because I had a football accident when I was younger. So I had uh, crusade ligament, uh, anterior crusade ligament broken, meniscus and lateral ligament. So because of this surgery, the arthrosis that the knee started earlier and I had uh, pr prosthesis. The kind of surgery that I had now, starting this year, has started to be robotized. 
Now, you need the experience of the surgeon, and you can really transfer this all the data thanks to AI techniques. But then you also have the operating scenario, and you have the sensitive quantities. And uh, typically, it's not only the geometric model of the bone that you have to implant the processes, but also, you know, the, the sophisticated system. Why not to account? for the consistency of the tissue and the models because then you can you can my view is that you can really get better results if you are able to clearly combine all the mathematical models and all for instance the sofa tool the sofa engine that we use for deformation is very powerful and also it takes advantage of a, a lot of data but again nevertheless to get good performance we use this uh, finite element model techniques, which is developed, which is a, which is a, a kind of modified to account for the elasticity, and uh, the results we are convinced that uh, are better than use just any kind of uh, simulation engine, any kind of data-driven uh, technique to control, the, uh, you know, to have the manipulation of of, of a soft tissue. So, I, I because you know just. Uh, I'm, I'm still an engineer. I'm, I'm fascinated by science. I'm fascinated by what you can really... Actually, one thing I forgot to say that uh, I want to share with you is that, uh, which is a common viewpoint of our community, I really think that robotics uh, as uh, well established in these 50, 60 years, because robotics, the first robot was, uh, was made in 19... I was born in 1959, which is the same year of uh, in which the first robot was uh, was made by George Deval in the US. So it's about 60 years. In these six years, I think all the methodologies and the technologies of robotics are well assessed. And it's no surprise that uh, any further progress are not within our community, but are at the crossroads with other communities, like the neurosciences that I show and other communities. So we really need people from AI, but let's do a crossroads. It's not just replacing all that, all the methodologies and all the technologies that we have achieved in these six years and replace with with algorithms with AI. So we have to make this uh, this kind of uh, of uh, of uh, of merge to appear. So that's why I wanted to share with you this concept of the physical artificial intelligence. Because for me, for, it's not only for me, for us, the roboticists, this is the challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank sure. you, Francesco. And uh, thank again to Professor Bruno Siciliano. Thank you for your, for your answers. Uh, thanks to Professor Dario, Professor Oddo, Professor Stefanini. Uh, I want to thank also the Associazione Allievi. I want to remind you to follow the Associazione Allievi on Facebook, on YouTube and to submit to its uh, newsletter. Uh, I want to also thank everyone listening. Apparently, we've had an average of over 200 people, 200 participants between Teams and YouTube, which is uh, very impressive. And I will leave the last word to Professor Dario. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> to, to say goodbye. Thanks a lot to Bruno Siciliano. Professor Siciliano, really for his uh, outstanding and passionate uh, presentation. As you said, uh, education is a trend. I, mean, I totally agree. And I think you gave a very nice demonstration of this. Uh, just one thing in addition, you know, we have uh, in, in a few weeks, uh, actually, another seminar on vision that will be held by Professor Usama Khatib. So you see, Bruno, you will be following. So all friends <laughs> will be with us. And I, I, I'm sure you will join us for uh, for uh, listening sure. to this. Uh, Send seminar. me the link. So, yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much again to you. And uh, oh, by the way, I see your wife, uh, you know, uh, Bruno's wife is... <laughs> Yeah, she was sure. there. I, I'm familiar with uh, with you, with your wonderful family, by the way. And uh, yeah, you're, you're so the, you're it's excited. beautiful. Nice it's beautiful to share. You know, in a sense, this is one of the advantage of uh, of uh, uh, 
uh, this kind of communication together with many disadvantages, of course. So thank you very, very much. And uh, so see you soon, okay? In a better, probably personal setting. Yeah, I hope so. Okay. I hope so. Goodbye all. Thanks. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. Good night. Thank you so much. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. I will, I will send the link where to download my file with okay. this.